Two years ago, we presented the Rockefeller Foundation's Jane Jacobs Medal to three leaders in the parks community. Betsy Barlow Rogers, who founded the Central Park Conservancy model, and Joshua David and Robert Hammond, who used that very model to create the High Line. And for those of you from out of town, I urge you to take a walk on the High Line. This is the type of innovative leadership that's defined by unique partnerships, and it's evident through, throughout so many of New York City's parks. And that is due in no small part to the mayor, Michael Bloomberg. He's worked tirelessly to ensure that no New Yorker lives more than 10 minutes from a park. And over the course of his tenure in office, we've seen an explosion of green space and trees. He's helped to shepherd through the creation of countless new parks and urban islands that have led to the greening of our landscape. In fact, his park agenda was so ambitious, he couldn't get it all done in two terms. <laughs> but the mayor's not just a local leader. He's been a visionary for mayors and city planners around the globe. He, he developed and leads the C40, a coalition of city leaders around the world taking sustainable action around climate change. And he's advised urban leaders throughout the world on how to make their cities greener and greater. So before I, I'm gonna go off script for a second, but uh, the mayor is my former boss. I worked for him in his first term. And I just wanna um, both thank him. It was a truly um, ecstatic experience for someone who grew up believing in good government um, he provided the encouragement and freedom to be creative, to be innovative, to push boundaries, to take risks. But as important is he, he, he always had your back um, and he provided real leadership to make sure you could succeed. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce the mayor of the city of New York, Michael Bloomberg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. And uh, Peter, thank you for that kind introduction. I know why you had to say those nice things about me when I was the boss. Uh, now uh, I really think you believe it. So uh, <laughs> great to be here. And it's great to be here with you uh, today on a pocket park right here in the middle of the stage. I am feeling greater and greener already. Uh, New York City couldn't be happier to welcome all of you and to host the International Urban Parks Conference this year. And I say that on behalf of 8.4 million New Yorkers who love their parks. And if you don't believe me, we just wanted to show you a few of the 8.4 million who wanted to send you their regards. Welcome to New York, greater and greener. Welcome to New York, greater and greener. Welcome to New York. Wait, 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 Tabor. Yeah. Greater, greener, and greater. Greater what? Greater and greener. Hi, greater and greener. Welcome to New York. Welcome to New York. Welcome to New York. Say welcome to New York. Marhaban, you may be New York. Bienvenidos a Nueva York. Nio Miu, Chuzu Valley. Nueva York is incredible and very Welcome to New York City. You want to relish with that? This week, our parks are your parks. China Center Boardwalk. Come and get a tan in Queens. Brooklyn is a great place to bike. Our stuff in the Rockaways. Join us for a swim. All parks are your parks. I'm joking, I'm joking. Uh, hey, 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 we are shameless. Uh, seriously, when you see the incredible enthusiasm in every borough for our parks and open spaces, I don't think it's any wonder that our administration has, from the very beginning, viewed New York's parkland as a vital resource. 
Amid the hustle and bustle of city life, parks represent a haven, an oasis where everyone and anyone can go to exercise, read the paper, walk the dog, have a picnic, or just relax. And whether you're looking to raise a family, start your career, or launch a business, parks make a neighborhood more attractive and vibrant. And I'm not just talking about the iconic spaces like Central Park and Prospect Park, but also the thousands of neighborhood parks and open spaces threads, uh, spread throughout the city. And under the leadership of Parks Commissioner Adrian Benepe, working with First Deputy Mayor Patty Harris, New York City has maintained our 29,000 acres of parkland while adding something like 730 new acres. And you'll be happy to know this important work will continue under Adrian's able successor, Veronica White, who is with us today. And she deserves a nice round of applause. Welcome, Veronica. Now, our city's commitment to parks does more than sustain us. It helps to grow our economy as well. In New York, like in many of your cities, parks have been shown to enhance area property values and improve quality of life, which in turn helps to attract newcomers who help grow our economy. And especially in tough economic times, we know how important it is to keep investing in the things that make New York a great place to live, work, and to visit. Last year, our parks helped us attract a record 50 and a half million tourists to this city. And they also helped us attract billions of dollars in private capital, making them powerful catalysts for community development. The High Line, for example, which Peter mentioned, and many of you have visited, I assume, over the weekend, is just one example. It has attracted some $2 billion, $2 billion in private investment in the area. And since the first section of the park opened in 2009, the High Line has welcomed more than 7 million people. In fact, the High Line welcomed 3.7 million people in 2011 alone, making it one of the city's most visited parks. Now, whether it's the High Line or the High Bridge in Upper Manhattan, uh, our administration has worked to revitalize old infrastructure and recast it in new ways that make sense for New Yorkers today. And that's especially true along our waterfront. When people think of New York City, they usually don't think of a waterfront. But that is starting to change. Hudson River Park, where the piers were mostly rotten for decades, has been reborn in spectacular fashion. The same is true for Brooklyn Bridge Park. You can go kayaking and play beach volleyball at both parks, which just seemed almost unimaginable only a few years ago. Rockaway Beach has become a top destination for surfers, and it has a brand new skate park, a synthetic turf football field, and a performance venue and a climbing wall. We've opened 40 miles of new greenways, much of it along the waterfront, and from Staten Island's South Beach Park to Barreto Park in the Bronx, from Astoria Park in Queens to the recently reopened historic McCarran Pool in Brooklyn, we are reconnecting New Yorkers to the water like never before. Altogether, we've invested more than $3 billion in capital improvements across the park system over the past decade, with another billion plus in our budget for future work. That is an enormous investment, but there's much more to our story than the city budget. Number one, these investments pay back many times over. Number two, the time to make these investments is during the tough times. In some senses, that's the good news in tough times. You can get people to focus and make the investments which give us a future. This city walked away from its future back in the 1970s. We've not done that during the past decade. And because of that strategy, New York City has replaced 200 percent of the private sector jobs lost during the last recession, while nationwide we've only replaced 40 percent. People say how? Well, it's making investments in things like parks and infrastructure that make the difference. From the beginning, we've pursued a three-tier strategy to maximize our ability to expand and improve parks. And I just wanted to mention a little bit about the three of them. First, we're exp we've expanded collaboration among city agencies. Second, we've strengthened partnerships among city, state, and federal agencies. And third, we put public-private partnerships to work as never before. Let me go down the line. First, by enhancing collaboration within city government, we've been able to capitalize on the diverse assets and expertise that different agencies have. 
One of the things in any big organization is getting people to work together. We've actually done that, I think, very well over the last 10 years. Since 2002, the Parks Department has worked closely with a host of other city agencies, including the Department of Environmental and Protection, uh, City Planning, Cultural Affairs, and Education. And that includes partnerships between the Parks Department and the Department of Education to convert 258 schoolyards into year-round playgrounds, by 2013, we've already converted more than 200. And with each new playground, we take a step towards fulfilling one of the central goals of Plan YC, our law city's long-term sustainability agenda. And that is making sure that every single city resident lives within a 10-minute walk of a park or playground. In addition to what we call schoolyards to playgrounds, the Department of Education has taken advantage of parks, facilities, and outdoor green spaces to promote the health and fitness of young New Yorkers, as well as offer the excellent and life-saving Swim for Life program to thousands of kids in public schools. In partnership between, partnership between our Department of Environmental Protection, Transportation, and Parks, we've taken up asphalt and cr concrete at thousands of intersections and traffic triangles to create little green streets, as we call these small parks, across the five boroughs. These green streets not only increase the city's parkland, they also capture storm water and help avoid combined sewer overflows, which is accelerating our dramatic restoration of the city's waterfront and harbor. We're also making hundreds of high-tech tree pits to serve the same function, which is all part of our $1.5 billion green infrastructure investment. The second tier of our partnership strategy to preserve and expand New York's parks and waterfronts uh, was to improve how the city works with other levels of government. For example, working with the federal government to revitalize Governor's Island, which many of you, I'm told, also visited over this weekend. It includes a $260 million investment our administration is making over the next two years to develop a new park in public spaces. It will include 2,000 new trees, public art installations, and areas for play and also relaxation. We're also working with the National Park Service to improve water quality and recreational opportunities at the 31-mile square Jamaica Bay Park. We've pledged to invest $115 million to improve water quality and restore the bay's fragile saltwater marshlands. And tomorrow, we will welcome Interior Secretary Ken Salazar and other officials to sign off on a magnificent management plan for Jamaica Bay's 10,000 acres. And we'll finally begin taking steps to develop a science institute that will be a hub for researchers to study the sustainability of urban parks. Now, no city has a monopoly on good ideas. The same benefits that parks bring to New York, uh, they bring to other cities around the world. And I think that this new institute will be an important center for learning and sharing ideas. And third, we've put public-private partnerships to work to bring 21st century parks and green spaces to New Yorkers. The High Line just could not exist but for the determined leadership and support it has received from civic-minded New Yorkers. Brooklyn Bridge Park is also the product of an incredible partnership between the city, state, and the private sector. And in these cases and many others, government just can't afford to build and maintain new large parks on the old infrastructure all by itself, but that doesn't mean that it can't be done. It just requires coming up with some creative ways to help finance the park with outside revenues. And sometimes the revenue can come through tapping into development possibilities, such as the Brooklyn Bridge Park, and sometimes it can come through a partnership with nonprofit organizations, as has been the case with the High Line. But there are many other examples of public-private partnerships. Uh, for instance, we work with Bette Midler's New York Restoration Project to launch Million Trees NYC, uh, our efforts spear spearheaded by Bette uh, to fulfill NYC's goal, uh, NY Plan YC's goal of planting one million trees by 2017. And if you'll see here, uh, I am with Big Bird back in 2007, planting tree number one. Uh, Big Bird is the one on the left, just. <laughs> Uh, this tree on our stage represents, right here, uh, represents one of the more than 600,000 trees planted throughout the city since that time. And that's over 100,000 trees per year, putting us ahead of schedule and on track to reach our ambitious goal. And just to put that in perspective, 
In the year before we launched Million Trees, we planted only 7,500. Today, it's uh, over 100,000 a year. And this partnership, I'm happy to announce uh, through a dynamic uh, gift from the Doris Duke Foundation and Tiffany, will form a national, national, natural areas conservancy that will restore, protect, manage, and expand a network of 10,000 acres of New York City forests, wetlands, and grasslands. And the conservancy will mirror successful public-private partnerships such as the Central Park Conservancy and the Prospect Park Alliance, but it will have responsibility for a far larger geographic area. It will also help to enhan enhance the enormous commitment our administration has made to ensure that our city's vital natural areas continue to thrive. Now, public-private partnerships have also been a powerful tool in our effort to make park centers of health and well-being for New Yorkers of all ages, and that includes the partnership between NYC Service, the city's Department of Health, Equinox Fitness, and the Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield that have brought free and low-cost programs like Shape Up NYC and Walk NYC to nearly 100,000 people last year, and we hope to do more even this year. And we've ushered in unprecedented levels of volunteerism and service in our parks from neighborhood groups and nonprofits, large corporations and small businesses, business improvement districts, and individual New Yorkers. As I said, though, we are not done. One of the most ambitious projects that we're working on is the transformation of fresh kills on Staten Island, which was once the world's biggest landfill, and we're transforming that into the biggest new city park in a century. And when completed, it will be a 2,000-acre preserve for mountain biking, trail running, kayaking, and horseback riding, among other activities. And Fresh Kills is among a group of former city landfills, including Fountain in Brooklyn and Pelham in the Bronx, that our administration is reclaiming and redeveloping into parks or natural grasslands. And this work is all part of our focus on environmental restoration, sustainability, and improving the quality of life for every New Yorker. The work this conference is doing to raise awareness of both the value of urban parks and the urgent need to fund, develop, and sustain them could not be more important, and I want to congratulate you all for coming today. Later today, you'll be tackling the all-important topic of advocating to and partnering with elected leaders from City Hall to Capitol Hill. And during this conference, you'll share best practices on parks management, promoting health and wellness, maximizing ecological benefits, and uh, fundraising for parks, just to name a few topics. Uh, each of you are on the front lines of the fight to preserve parks all across America and throughout this world. You're working with local, state, and national governments to ensure that millions more people have access to the incredible benefits that brings uh, communities together. Uh, your cities are all lucky to have you, and New York is grateful that you brought your passion and expertise here. Uh, as you know, we'll be hosting a reception in your honor tomorrow at Gracie Mansion. I hope you uh, will enjoy that. Uh, while you're here, I want you to be sure to uh, um, spend some money because we need the tax revenues. <laughs> uh, tomorrow at Gracie, you will be able to eat and drink to your heart's content as long as your sugary beverage is less than 12 ounces. <laughs> Um, once again, thank you for coming to New York. We don't do everything right, uh, but we've worked hard and we're willing to learn from others. So uh, we view this as a learning experience and opportunity for us to find out what other people have done. And we are shameless. We will plagiarize it all right here and we urge you to do what we do. Thank you and have a good day.